Praise the Lord, everyone. My name is Mario. Welcome back to the podcast, Hidden Testimonies. Uh, The podcast is dedicated to providing a platform for those who want to share a testimony and how God has done something amazing in their life. We are now hitting episode 9 or 10. I'm, I'm just kind of racing to episode 21. I was, I was speaking with uh, a good friend of mine who's kind of an, an expert in the analytics of Spotify and stuff, and he told me, he's like, if you can just get to episode 21, you will have done 95% more than any other podcast ever published. So right now, that's kind of really my goal is, is to run to that, but you know, today I'm very, very excited uh, for today's guest. We're going to talk a little bit about you know his, his testimony, what he wants to share, talk about a book that he's written um, for the uh, apostolic community and the Christian community in general, and uh, really excited to to learn more about um, learn more about him. But before we do that, I just want to thank everyone who's been listening and um, enjoying these podcasts. I know for me, it has been such a blessing to not only have the opportunity to meet people who actually want to genuinely discuss their testimonies, because I don't think there are enough people that do that. And your testimony is the starting point for every conversation. And you never know what one testimony can do, because I know it was because of a testimony that it changed my life. And I'm sure people, there are probably people I have ran into that because of my testimony, eventually God you know, placed that seed, and then it produced a great harvest in their life. And again, I give all honor and glory to Jesus. Um, it's you know, not my words or not my works, but it was him working through me. So with that being said, um, today, who I've got with me, I've got a pastor, I've got a father, I've got a husband, I've got a author now. <laughs> he, um, he's a, a very um, good, good friend of mine. He was my wife's um, first pastor um, here in, in North Carolina. And he's got a thriving church that are increasing in numbers, increasing in depth and knowledge of the Spirit. We are actually, we meet, we're meeting right now inside the church building right before their uh, midweek service. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a blessing. I can't wait to be a part of that. But he so graciously was able to sacrifice a little of his, of his time. He's, he's, a, uh, he's married to a uh, you know, beautiful wife. He's got four beautiful children. Very, very you know, busy man. Just got a new job. So for him to, you know, even uh, uh, you know, want to meet up with me, I, I really appreciate that. But uh, you know, with that being said, I definitely want to know a little bit more about you. I want you to talk about how you started the work here in Abundant Life Monroe. How this, how this miracle came to be. We'll talk about your book. But before we get into that, I want to get into the most pressing question. I think my listeners are going to ask. That is, Pastor Robinson, in heaven, is it going to be Krispy Kreme or Donut Palace? Oh, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> it's going to be Krispy Kreme. I don't have to pray about that one. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't have Krispy Kreme at the, the Passover. I'm just... <laughs> Oh, that's something my wife constantly brings up, and and when I when we tune in, she she loves to tune in while we're getting ready for church because we have church in the afternoon, and she loves to tune in to Abundant Life, and 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 during just that short period when you all are having services, and right before I go to sound check, I just hear that Krispy Kreme reference all the time, and it absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I made a mistake at bringing up Krispy Kreme, and it was like five years ago, mm-hmm. and it was like the first time I mentioned it. And then Pastor Appreciation rolled around, yep. and I had gift cards upon gift cards. Upon oh gift my! Cards. And we don't have Krispy Kreme around here; like we have to drive to Charlotte to go. Oh <laughs> so my! So I had to goodness. purposely go out of my way to use my gift cards. That is hilarious. But I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, setting that aside, um, you know, you—if uh, uh, I'm not mistaken—I think I've heard from my wife. You—you you were the—you were the youngest ordained minister in either in this district or in this area, or pastor. I'm not sure which one of those titles Um, it was. Probably not in the history, but at the time, yeah, I was one of the youngest pastors we had. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't don't think I hold the the record or anything of that matter. I just Mm -hmm. know that, you know, if you look at a national average, not even just in the apostolic church, but it's just in church as a whole, Yeah, I think the average age is like 55 to 65. Mm. I mean, it's, it's like, where did the young ministers go? Right. You know, you hear about like my heroes, like Reverend Wayne Huntley or Brother Carpenter or, or uh, 
the man can, you know, they all started in their 20s yeah. doing something for God. Might not have been pastoring a church, but they right. were doing something for God. And, sure. And, you know, I look around a, a lot of my peers where I used to and be like, what are we doing, guys? Right. <laughs> why, why aren't we involved? And then it was just happened that it was the will of God that I started pastoring eight mm-hmm. years ago at 22. Wow. So, 22. 22. So now you have, you have crossed over 30 now. I have. I have 30, I'll be 31 <laughs> in February. 31. Now, a 30 uh, single guy like me when I was 30, probably versus 30, have, having already had three children at that time, probably a lot different. Yeah, so. yeah a little different. <laughs> and yeah. being a pastor and everything that comes with the work. But, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear, you know, your testimony on, you know, so eight years ago, God obviously called you. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, you were living in a different state. How did, how did all this come to be? Well, the short story is um, this church closed down uh, due to one reason or another. And uh, my father-in-law was the presbyter of our area, and he got you know, handed the church deed and keys and things of that nature and was asked to just, you know, to do something with it mm-hmm. and to at least hold it for five years. Um, all this was going on, I had no no idea about it because, like you said, I was in a different state. I lived in Maine. Um, I was a youth pastor up there at my wife's grandfather's church. We had just gotten married. Um, we had had our first child. We were about to have our second child. I was working in a warehouse, and my knee gave out during a youth service, and... Uh, I had to have knee surgery, so I, I was I was on the bench for a while. Wow. And my wife came to me around March or April and said, can we go to my parents for Easter? I can't do anything else, can't go to work, can't really do much. So, yeah, I got my pastor's blessing. He didn't need me, so we just got on a plane, flew down here. Uh, and while we were visiting, my father-in-law was kind of telling me that, you know, as a presbyter, I helped take care of our churches. Do you have any experience with, with like, remodels? Can you, can you give quick estimates of, like, what it would cost to fix a roof, to fix a foundation, to do carpets, to do sheetrock? I said, I can give you, you know, I've done a lot of residential stuff because my dad owns rental properties. Yeah. So I can give you a ballpark, mm-hmm. but I can't tell you definite. He goes, that, that's good. So he picked a night. We got in the car. Me, him, my wife, her mom's sister, our, our son, and uh, one of my friends. We drove over to this church, and he unlocked the door, and I kind of gave him estimates on the painting and on the carpets and on the roof. And, you know, then in our family fashion, the piano was still set up. My mother-in-law got on the piano, which just started playing. So we start singing, and then singing turns into prayer, and then prayer turns into really good prayer. Mm-hmm. And so we're kind of all, like, dispersed, and everybody's got their spot, and we're praying. And I was sitting back in the back of the church, second to last pew. Okay. And I'm just sitting there praying, and I'm weeping my eyes out. Just Lord's just moving. And I didn't have what I would call a vision, because in my head, a vision is like it's happening real time. You can see it. It's, but it was more like God gave me an imagination. God gave me an image. Okay. I looked up from the pew, and the entire altar area was filled with people, all kinds of people, young people, older people, men, women, different races and colors, all different backgrounds. You could, For some reason, you could just tell some were doctors and lawyers, some worked at gas stations and Target. You know, it was, it was mm. everybody and anybody you could think of. Yeah. And I could hear the message being preached. I'm like, boy, this is just good. And he's talking John 10, 10. I have come to give you life, life more abundantly. And, and I'm just, I'm weeping. They're being filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm in the back just crying and crying. And, and this is all going on, and it's all, it's all taking place, and then boom, it all stops. Everybody in the altar turns around, looks at me, and says, come help us. Wow. And I lose it. I'm weeping in the back. I'm just, yeah. I'm like, what in the world? I'd always argued with my wife that I was never leaving Maine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always told her, I'll go anywhere God wants to take me. Yeah. I'm just not leaving Maine. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, now I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place. I know I'm being called to something. Yeah. I don't fully understand it. Yeah. But I know I'm being called, and so I fleece the Lord. I said, I'm going to need a sign Okay. Uh, that this is you. And I got up, walked out of the prayer room, out of the sanctuary, walked back into the pastor's office, what was the pastor's office. Yeah. Everything was gone in this church. Like, it was, it was cleaned out. The Matthews Church had come in. They had cleaned out all the stuff. They had cleaned it up. I think they had used it for a couple services trying to get something started. But, like, the office was completely empty, except for two signs. Okay. And they were leaning up against the wall. And I looked at them, and the first sign said mission, 
And the second sign said revival. Wow. I'm like, man. Well, there it is. <laughs> man. Man, I went and talked to my father-in-law on the way home. Yeah. And uh, I just said, you know, I don't know why. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I feel called to come help this church. And uh, the funniest part about that was when he looked at me and, and he said, you know, I was going to talk to you about this tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm my like, what? Gosh. He goes, yeah, we've been looking for somebody to come and. And to breathe life into this church, and he kind of gave me the backstory of how it shut down. There was no people, yeah, just an empty building. But they had tried to get something started, and he says, "I just can't find anybody." He said, "God kind of put you on my heart, and I was going to talk to you." Wow. He said, "Obviously, he didn't want to wait." And so, within a few months, we waited for our second child to be born. Yeah. And then right after that, God opened the door. We moved down here. I got a job. We started the church. Met Anna, and it was our first Bible study. Isn't that crazy. Uh, we used to do Bible studies in Starbucks yeah. because we were backslidden then. No, <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Couldn't go to Dunkin' Donuts. Couldn't no. go to Dunkin' Donuts. So. <laughs> no, we had, a, we had a great time. Yeah. Um, and everything has kind of just happened. Yeah. Like I can't put anything, my finger on anything and say, because I'm here, revival took place. Meaning like I can't take credit for it. I was involved. Right. I was submitted. But everything that's ever happened here has happened because God allowed it or God ordained it or God led to it. Right. And I have to be very specific when I go to prayer and just thanking God for just having a ticket or being in the audience to say, right. you know. So did you ever have a dream while you were youth pastoring that yeah. one day you would be kind of like, I guess you like a senior pastor or head pastor I always of... felt a call to pastor. That's, see, that's the thing I, I struggled with. Because you always hear the testimonies of, I never wanted to be a pastor and God called me. And I was like, maybe it's not the will of God because that's not me. Yeah. I do want to be a pastor. Not because I wanted to be better than everybody else. You know, maybe like when I was younger. Like, sure. Pastor's top dog. I want to be top dog. But I just, I always felt, I, I loved my pastor so much. And I appreciated him so much. I didn't care about sports. Once I got into church, I gave up baseball. I remember being in Little League and they're like, hey, practice on Sundays and I was a catcher and I was the fourth to batter up because I could always clear the plate you know yeah and loved it my coaches were always like you know if you take this into middle school high school you could possibly go college and you know I always had that dream as a kid and then once we got in church and realized I'd have to miss Sunday services I said sorry guys this ain't for me wow my mom didn't have to tell me my pastor didn't have to tell me that is so interesting I was going to say was it was it a parent's decision no. or this is no, coming from my, a young my dentist. dad wasn't living for the Lord at the time yeah so he was very upset uh, my mom was not, she, she didn't pressure us. She trained us. There's a difference. <laughs> so she's, she would give us all the principles we needed and then yeah. let us try to make that decision on our own. And, and I just remember being so in love with, with God, being so in love with the church, mm -hmm. having so much respect for my pastor that giving up on that stuff didn't matter because I had something better. Wow. I remember my pastor used to take me everywhere. Like Bible studies, Dennis, you're coming with me. Uh, we'd go door knocking every Saturday. Dennis, you're coming with me. You know, we'd go to hospital visits, Dennis, you're coming with me. And he was, like, without training me or telling me he was training me, training me on what you do in the ministry for people. I just fell in love with it. I just, growing up, you know, I didn't start as the youth leader. I started as an usher. And I thought that was the greatest job in the world, holding doors open for people, leading them to their seats, handing out songbooks, taking yeah. up the offering, um, helping people to their cars, holding umbrellas. You know, so you I've, just always had this heart to serve. I've always wanted to serve people. I loved mowing the lawn at the church. I used to mow the lawn and clean the toilets, and everybody complains about that nowadays. But even today, eight years uh, into this, I still clean the toilets. And you know what? Cleaning toilets. I feel like I do back when I was 13 years old going, you know, somebody's grateful for this. <laughs> Someone's, hey, someone has you to do it. You got to serve, man. Someone has to do it. And so I've always, I've always loved to preach, yeah. not for the glory, but... There's just a connection, a different kind of connection you get when you're up there behind the pulpit. It's like a spiritual adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love to preach not amazing messages that leave you saying, wow, mm -hmm. like, like, wow, he's a great preacher. But I love to preach messages that say, wow, that changed my life. Mm -hmm. I can apply that. Yeah. I can do something with that. I may not be able to compete with all the other preachers in the world, and I'm not trying to because I'm not them, they're not me. But as a pastor and as a preacher, putting those two things together and, and seeing somebody walk away, even if it's the most simple message, and it's like, hey, that was grade level, but it changed their life. Yeah. And they finally got a principle out of the Bible that they can apply to their life and grow in their relationship with yeah. Christ. 
I can't ask for anything better than that. My wife and I were discussing your message you preached on Sunday on, on He Is. Yeah. And I was just talking about, I was like, that was such just a very simple message. And you said it'd be a very simple, short message. You kept true to the word. Yeah. And you just said, look, look at the circumstances you, Mary found herself in. But that does not change who Jesus is. Look at the circumstance of Joseph. And definitely, uh, you know, the, the marketing side of, of the birth of Jesus makes it very cute. Yeah. But if you really, if you really think about it, if, if you walked on a farm, it smells. It's yeah. nasty. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so they make it this very cute nativity type of scene, and, and that's great. You know, that, that's great for even kids to grasp that concept. But if you really go to, like, a farm, you know, yeah. it is a nasty environment. That's where Jesus was. You're telling me that's where Jesus was born? Yeah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born in a barn, laid in a place where I think historians say they used to lay the food for the animals. Wow. And he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's not like... The, the, the newest thing from, from, you know, your children's line of clothes. That's, that's like the rags they had left over. Wow. Or as some historians say, the, the rags that they used to wrap the newborn sheep in. You know, when, they, when, the, a sheep, when the lamb was born, they would wrap mm-hmm. them in this and, and clean them up. Yeah. I mean, how fitting that the lamb slain for sinners was wrapped in swaddling clothes, but I can't verify that. Our but used still, rags. <laughs> just, just the fact that he had a humble beginning remained humble all throughout his life, knowing that he was God manifest in the flesh, going to die for the world, and on the very cross, forgive them, they know not what they do. Come I on mean, now. he's perfect. Her situation wasn't perfect, but yeah. he is. Yeah. And when you make it simple, I don't know who said it, but having kids now, it really hits me. If you can't explain it to a toddler, you probably don't understand it yourself. Oh, wow. And that's how I've tried to be as a pastor. I always wanted, growing up, to have an effect in, in the ministry, to yeah. be effective. Well, the best way to do that is, is to give some people things they can digest and they can apply. I had a guy in my church, and he wasn't being ugly, but it's just the way he is and the relationship we have. It's so good, and we're open. We don't get offended. He came in my office after I had preached a message one time. He goes, that was a good message. I said, thanks. Thanks, bro. And he goes, now what do they do with it? And he just got up and walked out. Wow. Now, in the moment, I'm like, what do they do with it? What do they do with it? They go to heaven with it. And then it hit me. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't tell them what to do with that message. Wow. And so I got in the prayer room. And now when I pray and I'm getting ready to minister, I say, God, tell me what I need to tell them. Yeah. Of how they apply this word. That's so amazing. So you mentioning that, my wife and I have had the opportunity over the past um, since since the beginning of October, we had went to NY, NAYC yeah. in July. Phenomenal. And each NAYC that I go to, they always leave the, you know, it's for the young people, right? But it's really for anybody that's, you know, under the sound of the preacher, uh, the pastor at that, at that moment. And they always say, hey, if you got the Holy Ghost and you have basic knowledge of this doctrine of God's Word, go out and make a Bible study with somebody. Yeah. Teach a Bible study. There's nothing holding you back right? God can use anyone at any moment, right? Of course, consult with your pastor. That's a great thing, but you could tomorrow find somebody and start, yeah. right? And by gauging on their level of the word, you will quickly know whether you are, you know, you either need to pass this on to someone who knows a little bit more about the word, or you can just teach the basics. Yeah. It's just about teaching the basics. And so I... One thing my pastor's taught me, I love that when he teaches Bible study versus some of our other ministers... Ministers, and I'm, I'm not dogging any one of them, they are anointed men of God, but there's one thing to throw the point at everyone, and there's another thing to ask the question so I can come up with an answer. Yeah. Can and if my answer right doesn't answer. align up with the, what will be the following answer, then, then it allows me to think on it. And so God put four souls, you know, in my path after I prayed, Lord, I want to start Bible study, you know, you've, you've always placed it on me. And so now I've got four souls I've been working with, and I'm just like, the greatest, and again, just speaking as someone who's never held a title at all, but just someone who has te- taught the basics, it's not about so much what we're preaching, it's what are they going to do with it afterwards? Yeah. How are they actually going to apply it? And that's something that 
as, as I was teaching it, I started asking myself, wow, I need to do that with every message that I personally hear. What am I going to do with this message, right? I don't need to worry about, is this message referring to some situation that happened? No, it needs to be, this message is for me. <laughs> and then I'll take what's mine and throw the, throw the rest over my shoulder to help the neighbor behind me. You know what I'm saying? And, and everything you just said right now of, wow, I, I didn't lead the people to... I think God does God does the work. It fell on good yeah. ground and it produced, and nothing, none, none of God words, you know, come back in vain. But hey, like challenge, challenge the people to grow. Well, I mean, it's kind of like the whole principle of why Jesus taught in parables. Right. He says, "I do it so that they'll understand." Right. I mean, he could have quoted the law at twelve years old. He's sitting in the temple, yeah. debating with the scholars. Yeah. Mom says, "Where are you?" And he says the scariest thing a child's ever said to his mother. No, you know, I was about my father's business. <laughs> One of us would have said that. We would have seen our father's business right outside right of the head. <laughs> Beat us. But Jesus, I mean, he could have, he could have wowed them. He could have, he could have left them in awe saying, look at how much he knows. Yeah. And yet Jesus is teaching his disciples. I teach him parables because I don't want to wow them. I want to feed them. Mm. I want them to digest it. I want them to take it. I want them to, to gain something from it. And then when he asked Peter, do you love me? Yeah, well, feed my sheep. Mm. And so what does Peter do? He makes it as simple as he possibly can. If I wanted somebody who was eloquent, I wouldn't have called a fisherman. I called you, Peter. Right. So take what I've taught you and give it to them so that they'll understand it. That's phenomenal. And, and as a minister, no matter where you serve, whether you have a title or you don't, to minister simply means to serve. And okay. we need more ministers in our churches. And I'm not just talking about pulpit ministry. That is like, everybody says that's the epitome. It's not. Men are called to that. Women are called to that. But not everybody is. Mm -hmm. But everybody is called to minister. Everybody is called to serve. So serve in a way that, that you leave people with an impact. You leave people saying, I know exactly what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what God is asking of me. And I know how to get there. And to me, that, that's better than preaching on the grandest stage. Bear good fruit. Fair, yeah. You shall, know that you, shall, you shall know they are mine by the fruit that they bear. Yep. So, phenomenal, phenomenal, everything you're saying, I'm, I'm in 100% agreement, and, you know, praise God, now that you have, have this church, let me ask you this here before we get into talking about uh, your book here, um, what's been something that has surprised you now over the past five years? Like, is there, is there like, one thing that just either looked impossible and God intervened, or just something that just surprised you in general? of, you know, cultivating the ground here in, in Monroe? Um, the biggest surprise was the hurdles. What I mean by that is I expected the biggest opposition to be something else. I expected it to be a spiritual attack. I expected it to be just, just something else. And what surprised me the most mm -hmm. was when God kind of, in prayer was talking to me and, and, and in a way said, not audibly, but just nudged me of, stop trying to impress me by building a church. And I went, what? Oh, yeah, you're going to have to go a little bit. Oh, a little, man, little, little exactly. Deeper there. A little deeper there. Stop trying to impress me. Everything I was doing was is trying to be like, God, I can build a church for you. You called me here because you want me to build a church for you. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to present it to you as a gift. And, 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 and it was almost like God had to check me and be like, I didn't call you to build a church for me. I called you here because I wanted to build a church and use you. Oh, okay. Because the Bible clearly states, uh, they that labor, labor in vain if the Lord doesn't build the house. Okay. And here I was trying my best efforts to impress God. When God's like, I don't want you to impress me. I just want you to submit to me. I want you to surrender to me. I, I want to. I want to use you. I, I want you to do things through me. I want you to be tender. I want you to be in obedience. I, I want you to be faithful. Wow. And through those simple things, yeah. Through walking with me, here I was. If I could just preach better messages, we'd have a bigger church. If I could have better events, we'd have a better church. Uh, I could pray. If, if I, I could, could fast. pray three hours, if I could fast for three weeks, if I could, if I could read the Bible through and the entire Bible through in three days, mm -hmm. you know, just stuff like that. If I could impress God, we'd probably have a bigger church. And God's like, stop making it so tough. If you would just walk with me instead of just work for me, there'd be a church. <laughs> there'd be fruit in your life. Which is, I mean, really, segue is where the whole idea of this book came from, is I preached a message, my name is Enoch. 
Everybody wants to be David. Everybody wants to kill giants. Uh, everybody wants to be Moses. They want to part the Red Seas. Mm-hmm. They want to be Noah. They want to build an ark. But what about Enoch? Enoch is the only guy in the Bible that has this testimony, that he pleased God. I mean, how, could we ask for any more? Yeah. To get to heaven and be like, you might have killed a giant. I please God. Yeah. Well, what did he do that was so special that he pleased God? Joel says he prophesied. But most of his story is found in Genesis where it says, and Enoch walked with God. That's it. I, re- I read this book, and it's like four, four verses. This, That's it. This man, this man is mentioned, and he never saw death. He was God taken loved up. him so much, was so impressed with him. There's that word. Right. That he said, you know what? I can't wait for this joker to die. I'm taking him now. Wow. And all he did was walk with God. We make it so tough. If I could just be the pastor, if I could just be a praise singer, if I could just teach 17 Bible studies, if I could just get to this area of my life, to this conference, to this part, to this type of ministry, I'd please God. And God's like, man, you're making it tougher than you need to be. It's not about how you work for me. It's about how you walk with me. Can you pray daily? Do you read my word? Do you worship me? Are you faithful? Are you faith-filled? Okay. Are you sensitive? Yeah. And those are the type of people that please God, not the people that preach uh, on the grandest of stages. You know, those people have their place, and we, I'm thankful for the, the movement that we, we honor have, them. that we pick the right people for the right message. I, it seems like we're hitting every time. Every conference that's had mm-hmm. uh, across our nation and world, it's like you can tune in at any time and just hear good, God-honoring messages, and I'm thankful for it. But God is really impressed with people who are there on Monday, who have a prayer life on Tuesday, Mm -hmm. who will fast on Wednesday, Mm -hmm. who read the Word every day, you know? The small things. The faithfulness. We had just, where my mother-in-law gave us a challenge to, we read the book of Luke each day corresponding to the day that it was in December from day 1 to 24, the last chapter in Luke. And so what are we going to do for the 25th? Like, hey, let's find, a, let's, find a, let's find a book in the Bible that's got six chapters, and let's finish it out. Galatians has six chapters, yeah. so we started reading that. Just last night, we read Galatians 3, and it says, Paul is talking to Galatians. He's like, you foolish, Gal- you foolish Galatians, how do, you expect to be, how do you expect to start in the Spirit and try to perfect it by your own human efforts? Doesn't and work. everything that you just said just now... Again, I don't know what you. I, I don't know. I don't know the thought process. Like I get where you come from, because it says I want you to present my church without stain, yeah. without wrinkle. You know, which I get that too. Okay, God's put this burden on me as a pastor. It is a gift from Christ that that He would He would use pastors and apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers so we could edify the church. So they could come to full knowledge and not be fooled by all these doctrines. And so you're like, okay, I've got this, I've got this huge call that God's called me to do because to be a pastor or to work in in the body of Christ is not a small thing. Yeah, like God sees it as the utmost highest. Because you're, first of all, you're walking my faith. You're walking into things that you don't see physically, but you're just going to say, God, you're going you're gonna to do these things by your spirit. You're going to do these things yeah. by your almighty hand. And I'm just going to kind of, I should be able to just go along with the ride. But then we, we kind of, maybe this is a, 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 an error you could say, or maybe just a miscalculated thinking, but we start inserting our own human efforts. We're like, yeah. okay, well, God, this is how you started, and I was I was going by faith now, but now that I've got to this point, I need to start doing my part. Yeah, let me take the reins real quick. And it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me, and I in you. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Well, the only way for Christ to be in me is for me to be submitted to him and be filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen. And at any time that I take the steering wheel back, I'm no longer in him. Anytime I try to go back to the flesh, like you were saying, I just throw a monkey wrench in the whole thing, and it just falls. You can pinpoint when my frustration hits in the church, I can always pinpoint it back to one sole purpose. I put my hands on something I shouldn't have. Wow. Meaning, like, I, I, I took, I, well, it's my turn to do this, God. And God's like, why? It didn't take you to get here. Yeah. It ain't going to take you to get out of here. That's it's going to take me and you being surrendered to me and just walking with me, which is why I say, like, 
with the church, things, to me, things just happen. But to God, it's always foreseen. Like he knows yesterday, today, he knows it all. Yeah. The end from the beginning. His way is higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So to me, it's like, whoa, that revival came out of nowhere. And God's like, no, I planned it. I planned it. <laughs> Bro, you don't know who I've been. And there's been so many times I've gotten in prayer and prayed for a specific soul in a specific situation mm-hmm. and say, God, just help them. And the first thing I get back is, I've been working with them and you didn't even know it. God, they're not going to take this very well. Yes, they will because I've been talking to them about it for three weeks. Oh. I'm just going to use you to. Exactly. He says, I'm just using you to confirm it. Yeah. Like, you're not not the first touch, man. My spirit draws them. And I'm like, okay. Oh, wow. And so I have to to remember that pastor is what I do. Child of God is who I am. Oh, preach. Come on now. And that's, and I get it from Enoch. It's all about my relationship with him. Am I walking with him daily? Yeah. Because the day I retire from the pulpit is not the day I stop being a child of God. Right. I'm a child of God till even in eternity. I'll be yeah. a child of God. When I'm up there in heaven, I'm laying my crown at his feet, child of God. Yeah. When I get to heaven, it's not going to be, well, come on in, Pastor Robertson. <laughs> Could you imagine me being like, oh my God. come on in, Dennis. Oh, that's Pastor Dennis that's to you. <laughs> Did you hold my Krispy Kremes like I told you to? <laughs> How many boxes you got? <laughs> But, yeah. Praise God. So let, let's get into this book here, okay? Uh, I know we got we only have a few more minutes here, but I do want do want to get into it. So you talked about just the character of Enoch is Enoch. what inspired you, but uh, who did the artwork? I mean, how did all this kind of come together? I, I did everything, everything, everything from the artwork uh, to the words. As you can tell, it's really in depth for the words. Very, very in depth. One of my friends asked if they could read it. I said, no, you have to get past about first grade first. So (laughs) (laughs) it's really simple, man. I got four kids. Yeah. Uh, my mom has been a Sunday school teacher her whole life, pretty much, or my whole life. Um, and you know, nowadays you got to be careful what you, what your kids read. You can't just hand your kids a book. hundred percent. And so my kids love when I tell stories, they love when I read the Bible to them. I said, why not put them together? I love to draw. Yeah. So I put it all together, made this for my kids, Yeah, published it through Amazon. Just a really, really shortened version. Probably not in this case shortened, but just just a brief version of, of Enoch's life, who he was as a Bible character. Yeah. The whole idea of this is this ain't going to be the first, the only book. It's the first one, but we, we'd like to do more. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife helps me with the ideas, and she'll edit and stuff. And my yeah. father-in-law, my pastor, has been a great... I mean, I just I told them when I sent them the text, I said, don't don't be offended by what I'm about to text you. Yeah. You are a very critical person. I need you to look at this book. Yeah. He goes, I got you. I got <laughs> he, you. He does it all. So, so he helped me with, with the wording and certain things and, yeah. you know, the punctuation. But illustration, the words, authoring, all that, that was all done by me, published through Amazon. Um, we we want to focus on the lesser-known Bible characters. You know, you've heard of David and you've heard of Peter. But what about Enoch and Andrew, Peter's brother, Yeah, who introduced Peter to Jesus and found the boy with the bag of lunch that Jesus used to feed the multitudes? Okay. There's good principles in their lives, too, yeah. that we can apply to our own. So I told my wife, why not focus on some of those lesser-known characters in the Bible mm-hmm. that still have value and still use as examples for us? And let's draw something from their story that we can use. Almost like just finding the hidden characters that, yeah. are, that, that have always been there, have always been mentioned. They're there. They just don't get their due time. You know, right. they're the ones that we don't preach about a lot. Yeah. But some of their stories are like, if you really sat down and thought about it, you're like, man, that hits differently. Yeah. That, that's, so so that's, that's the plan. Hopefully we'll have more books. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited. I hear thinking maybe going to translate it. I've We'd got a love, Spanish audience here. We that, would that love need. to translate it into Spanish. Um, I think it'd be really simple because, like I said, it's not a whole lot of words. Yeah. The pictures would stay the same. <laughs> So nah, you got to put a taco in it. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, hey, I can say that. I can. You say can that. say that. I can say that. <laughs> Lord, oh, Father, forgive him for he know not. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. Converse's that Enoch's wearing, right? They change those to Nikes. <laughs> Do something different. Yeah, just to spin it up just a little bit. Yeah. But no, we we. I just wanted to be a blessing to people. I've had a bunch of people get it. Um, I'm trying to keep it honestly, and I'm I'm looking now at the price of the book. I'm trying to keep it as cheap as possible. Yeah. Or let's say it. Let's say it better, affordable as possible. Yeah. Because I'm not looking to get rich off of it. Mm-hmm. This that's not what this is. This isn't a. In fact, I'm buying a bunch of copies so that I can give them out to our church. You know, like when we do baby dedications or we have Christmases, just yeah. give them out to the kids. 
Because if it will help introduce somebody to the Bible and give them a hunger to go and to study the Bible for themselves and to find these characters, worth it. That's worth it. Worth That's worth it. every every amount of time and dollar that I put into the project. Yeah. It, it's worth it. And so that that's really what we're looking to do. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I read it. I enjoyed it. Oh, good. And I think, you know, there's going to be a Spanish audience that, that needs this. There's going to be a German audience. Oh, yeah. I mean, like you said, it, it is the, the idea is it's simple. Um, any, any parent can buy this. Any teacher, right, who can, yeah. uh, of a Sunday school can buy, yeah. buy bulk copy of these and hand this to their, you know, one to six, seven, eight-year-old, and just let them enjoy it, you know. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, everyone runs the YouTube now, and we get we spend hours getting distracted on that. Let's just take five minutes, yeah. introduce them to a character like Enoch, and just like, I love the questions that you have at the end. Yeah, the purpose. And, and that's that uh, that applying part, right? Yeah. You, you read about the story, it's it's a great, you know, uh, cute little story. But after that, it's just like, well, how can how can I please God? Yeah. And then uh, have I prayed today? Have I, Have I read the word today, have I worshipped him yeah, It's kind of like a mini Bible study for kids. Absolutely. Just a, a, can we apply it? Can we use it? Can we grow? Praise God. So when can, when can, so they just go on Amazon to find this? Amazon, my name is Enoch, should be the first result that pops up. Right, the, only, the only result. The only <laughs> result that pops up. Everyone, yeah, Amazon's just like, wait a minute, Enoch. Never heard of that. Never yeah. heard of this guy. This guy's saying he's in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, obviously, you know, those who are listening or if, we're, or if they if you cross upon this uh, episode here, you know, uh, help support, you know, uh, Dennis Robertson and his um, newfound career, Monroe uh, bestseller. Monroe bestseller, <laughs> Monroe yeah. Monroe bestseller. And uh, obviously support, support this. The, anything that... Anything that's inspired, I imagine, was inspired by the Holy Spirit will be profitable for His kingdom. And, uh, you know, we, we already bought two copies. We've gifted those two copies already. And uh, with that being said, I think it's uh, time to have some Bible study and let you take over, okay? Sounds hey, it's good. been a pleasure. Thank God bless you. <clears throat>